Hi, it's Emily from the Broken Science Initiative, and I want to discuss a topic that is the cornerstone of scientific research, yet widely misunderstood, the p-value. This is actually really, really important because it's a part of why we find most research findings are false, and it's also why we have a replication crisis. And you're not alone if you don't understand. In fact, I would probably argue that you're better off than most doctors since you're actually willing to acknowledge that you don't understand. This is an article about how medical professionals don't understand statistical testing, which is the basis for a lot of the research that we rely on. So quote, in a JAMA article, 80% of residents expressed fair to complete confidence in understanding p-values, but 100% of them had the p-value interpretation wrong. Make no mistake, they are the future experts and leaders in clinical research that will affect public health policies, treatment options, and ultimately people's health. So hopefully that entices you enough to check out the rest of this video. So let's talk about what they are. Null hypothesis significant testing requires that a researcher propose a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis, that they collect data and they use that data to compute the probability of obtaining a finding as extreme or more extreme than the one actually obtained given that the null hypothesis is true. If this probability is low, less than 0.05 is the convention, then the researcher rejects the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. Otherwise, the null hypothesis is not rejected. Now, there must be an easier way to say that. So let's try breaking it down a bit before we really get into all the details. Null just means none. So the null hypothesis is just saying that there is nothing to see here. There is no chance no change, no effect. The alternative hypothesis is the new idea, thing, drug, whatever it is that you're looking at or that you're hoping to study. And the p-value is what happens when you compare these two. So let's say that your kids seem to fall asleep faster when you give them melatonin. If you wanted to study that, you'd say the null hypothesis is that the melatonin makes no difference. There is no effect. That's the null. The alternative hypothesis is that the melatonin does have some effect. And I'll get into why this doesn't work the way that we think it does a little bit later. But for the sake of this, let's just explain what people tend to think the p-value shows. If you tested this on your kids, and at night, some nights you gave them melatonin and some nights you didn't, and then you measured how fast they fell asleep, and you found that they fell asleep faster with the supplement, you would run this statistical analysis and you'd let's say you find that you have a p-value of 0.05 or less, you'd say that it was a significant finding. That's extremely flawed. Um, and this test was never designed to show anything about cause or validate your findings or say that the alternative hypothesis was right. It was designed exclusively to reject the null hypothesis by looking at data, not the hypothesis. And in modern medicine, it has come to be believed that sort of like some religious right, that it is proof that the intervention works. It does not do that. And I will explain this more in this video. This is such a massive problem in modern medicine and you don't have to take my opinion for it. It's been well documented and dating back as far as the 1940s, researchers have been complaining about this misinterpretation and this misuse of p-values. A review of p-values in biomedical literature from the 1990s to 2015 shows that these widely misunderstood statistics are being used increasingly instead of better metrics of that would measure the size of the effect or uncertainty. So it goes on to say that in March of 2019, Nature published a comment with over 800 signatories calling for the end of significance testing with P being less than 0.05. And at the same time, the American Statistical Association that 
basically carried this statement, which had already called for the abolition of that practice of p-values being the standard, published a special issue with 43 articles exploring ways to report results without significance testing. Now, these are major organizations calling for this. So you don't have to take my word for it. it you can Google this and find this everywhere, but it's still the conventional way of doing these things, which is hugely problematic when you're trying to navigate what results are real results or what results you should rely on. So understanding this basic idea of what a p-value is and what it isn't will help you tremendously as you think about things, including like news headlines about, you know, business studies, it's psychology. This is like so pervasive. It's used everywhere. I actually heard from somebody recently that they had a paper that was a physics paper that was likely going to be rejected because they didn't use a p-value. I mean, this has just become this weird arbitrary standard and it doesn't do what people are claiming it does. It shows nothing about whether your study can be replicated. Now, if you need more incentive to watch the rest of this video and really try to just get a handle on why these are so problematic, let's take a look at some of these headlines. I went to the news section of Google and then I type in scientists find significant. You could do this every day and you would find hundreds, if not thousands of headlines claiming that scientists somewhere found something significant. They are all relying on p-values. You cannot get published in a peer-reviewed journal if you do not have a p-value of less than 0.05. So we'll get into what the flaws are and how they come about in a little bit more detail. But any time that there's a significant finding that's been published in a peer-reviewed medical journal and then republished by the mainstream media, it's all reliant on this notion that p-values are finding some significant outcome that has to do with treatment. And our larger environment is really, really problematic because even though these high impact journal editors know this is problematic, it still is such a convention that everybody's doing it and, and they, the burden is on the system to change, which I'm not sure it ever will. So let's get into a little bit more about what p-values are, what the real problems are, so that when you're looking at this information or having a conversation with your doctor, you're able to articulate some of these concerns and you're able to know what to look for. Okay, let's dive in. P-values are just a statistical analysis. They are doing what they were told to do, but we seem to have completely forgotten what they were designed to do and what they were not designed to do. And we're using them in medicine incorrectly. In order to get published, you need to have a significant P-value. And perhaps that's why we've exalted them to this level of godliness, but we need to acknowledge that they really don't live up to that hype and they're not helping us in terms of this replication crisis. We've come to think of them as a tool of validation that somehow proves that something is proving an underlying hypothesis. They do not do that. P-values can only tell you something about the data and even that sort of effect has been really exaggerated in our zeitgeist. So if you get one thing from this video, it's that P-values do not validate results of an experiment and they do not tell you anything about whether a study or an experiment can or will be replicated. And when you read and watch the news and they say, drug found to significantly reduce stupidity, <laughs> that's a reference to a p-value. Basically, anytime the word significant in all of its various forms is used, it's because someone has proclaimed a p-value of less than 0 0.05. Okay, first let's clarify what a p-value is p-value or probability value is used in hypothesis testing to help us decide whether or not to reject a null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is a general statement or default position that there is no relationship between two measured phenomena or association amongst groups. For instance, let's suppose that we're testing a new drug. The null hypothesis would be that the new drug has no effect on a particular disease. The p-value is the probability of observing the data, or something more extreme, given that the null hypothesis is true, meaning that the drug has no influence, it is the same as the null. The intervention and the null are the same. But the first problem with p-values is this sort of assumptive language. 
It is commonly misunderstood as the probability that the null hypothesis is true. It's not saying anything about that, so that is incorrect. To illustrate this, imagine that you're a detective and you're trying to prove someone's guilt. The p-value would be akin to the probability of finding a particular piece of evidence, like a suspect's fingerprints on the murder weapon, assuming that the suspect is innocent. A p-value indicates that the evidence is unlikely if the suspect is innocent, but it does not tell us the probability that the suspect is guilty or innocent. The p-value is looking only at finding evidence, not at anything about guilt or innocence of the suspect. Another issue with p-values is that they give a false sense of security by oversimplifying the complex nature of hypothesis testing into a binary kind of decision, reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. This is the frequentist sort of yes, no, one or zero approach, which has had a really detrimental influence on this kind of science, which is probably better suited for probability theory and probability than these sort of binary outputs. Okay, so let's say that the suspect is guilty or innocent based on one single piece of evidence without considering all of the other available evidence and the context in which that evidence is found, that's sort of what we're looking at when we rely on p-values. So this industry focus on p-values has also led to what we call p-hacking or data dredging, which is where we sort of have this practice of performing many different multiple analysis on data sets until we get a result that's significant, so less than 0.05. This is analogous to a detective examining multiple pieces of evidence and only presenting the ones that support their case while ignoring the ones that do not. So at the Broken Science Initiative, we have been very critical of null hypothesis significance testing in general. And a large part of that is that p-values are a key component of that and they're not doing what people think they do. So we think that's a flawed method because it doesn't provide evidence of the null hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis. It only allows us to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis based on this arbitrary threshold of 0.05. Again, this is so limited as to be almost meaningless. I would say maybe it is meaningless, like a judge deciding a case based on one piece of evidence. Uh, rather than considering sort of like the totality of the cases that have been presented before them. So another often overlooked aspect of p-values, which is important, they're affected by sample size. So p-values are highly sensitive to sample size. The larger the sample size, the more likely it is that, that you'd get a small p-value, even if the effect size, which is the magnitude of the effect, is the same. This is because the larger the sample size, the more precisely estimated the population parameters and even small differences become statistically significant. This is a crucial point to consider when interpreting p-values because a small p-value does not necessarily mean a large effect size or any kind of practical significance. It may simply reflect a large sample size. An important point to note is that p-values do not evaluate the underlying validity of a hypothesis. They only focus on data. In other words, a p-value doesn't tell you anything about the actual hypothesis that you are testing. It only tells you something about the observed data under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. So let me explain this a little bit more because I think this confuses people. Suppose you're testing a new drug and your hypothesis is that the new drug reduces blood pressure more than the placebo group. You conduct a study and calculate a p-value based on the observed data in your studies. Now let's say that you get a p-value of 0.03. Many researchers would interpret that evidence as the drug being effective because the p-value is less than the commonly used threshold of 0.05. However, this interpretation is not entirely correct. The p-value of 0.03 only tells you that assuming the null hypothesis is true, i.e. that the drug has no effect, there is a 3% chance of observing a difference in blood pressure as large as or larger than the one observed in your study. It does not tell you anything about the probability that the drug truly works, which is what we actually are interested in, right? We want to know if the drug 
works. Okay, so if that isn't enough, the p-value does not consider other important factors that definitely affect the validity of your hypothesis, such as the design of your study, the sample size, which we've talked a little bit about, or the possibility of confounding variables, which we can talk about in another video. So for instance, if you get a statistically significant p-value, your study may still be flawed due to a small sample size or uncontrolled confounding variables or all a host of other things. So the conclusion that the new drug is effective may still be invalid. It's essential to understand that the p-value is one piece of the puzzle, a very small one, and I would argue not worth so much attention and yet is like this massive requirement where you can't get published in a peer-reviewed journal unless you have a significant p-value and the way its significance is determined is relying on this thing that is not even telling you if the null hypothesis is true. It's not telling you that you can replicate this experiment. It's not telling you that there's anything truly significant about the outcome or the end result that you're looking for in a drug trial or any other kind of medical intervention. So I am a big fan of people like Gerd Gigerenzer who have now successfully are at the Max Planck Institute doing very well and are able to publish without doing p-values because he's written so much and so well, which we have his work on the Broken Science Initiatives website um, on why this is like a ritual that we're all falling prey to, but that it's sort of meaningless and it's time to just say goodbye to the p-value. Hope this was helpful.